Lord Patterman Barnes and Sir David Tang. Conservative Party, Governor of Hong Kong, famous um, person, author responsible for policing Northern Ireland, and a European Commissioner, Chancellor of Oxford, Chairman of the BBC Trust, Companion of Honour, um, I can go on. Yeah. No, you can, you can go on. <laughs> I'm enjoying this. <laughs> what? Yeah. Is there any more summit you want to scale? Well, you, you left out the... Um, <laughs> you, you left out the affair with uh, Elizabeth Taylor. <laughs> She's dead. <laughs> uh, takes all sorts. Um, uh, no, I, I sometimes think that... And people never believe me. Um, uh, when well, I say this at least, um, I sometimes yearn for a quiet life, but I seem somehow to have attracted, which does genuinely surprise me, um, a number of jobs during my uh, passage, um, which have um, produced quite a lot of controversy. Um, I actually think, sorry, this is a passingly serious remark, I actually think that, that life is a predicament rather than a series of challenges. So maybe I shouldn't uh, be too bothered um, by the fact that um, uh, I've fet fetched up doing so many things which have um, uh, led to me waking up at five o'clock in the morning. But I'm sort of looking forward to the point where I don't do that um, anymore. Are you sensitive about people's criticisms? I'll tell you a story. I've given everybody I know who's been in significant positions and who have sought my advice the same advice about criticism. I say to them, really, don't worry, don't read the papers, don't get concerned about it. I can remember when I was in Hong Kong, um, when I used to come back to the UK, uh, I'd invariably be asked to go and have um, a checkers curry with John Major. Um, Is that the right word, curry? <laughs> <laughs> I can't think of what you're saying. Since my French is inadequate to translate double entendre. Um, um, anyway, to have liver and bacon and with John Major. And he would talk about what this or that newspaper had written about him. And I'd say, really, you know, don't get the first editions, don't read the first editions before you go to bed, stop worrying about it, just get on with things. And he said, yes, I know you're right, I know you're right. So um, about three or four weeks after we had, we had that conversation, um, Lavender and I were on holiday with our kids and two other families. We'd taken a house in Italy 
Um, and about the three, third or fourth day, um, the Italian housekeeper comes out while we're all sitting down um, for lunch and says, uh, I think she says, he's number 10 on the phone. It's a huge face for me. <laughs> so, Hello. <laughs> Ten wonderful people. So I pick up, I go out and pick up the phone, and it's John Major, and he says, well, "Where are you, Chris?" And I say, "I'm on holiday." So he says, um, "So did you see that piece in the Sunday Telegraph about me for the weekend?" So it's really difficult to get people um, to take that advice seriously. So cutting to the chase. Do I take it seriously about myself? No. Um, I pretend that I don't notice, um, and I pretend that it doesn't matter. <coughs> it always does. I mean, you have to be—you have to have a hide made of made of rhino skin for it not to matter to you, um, because you always assume, which is wrong, that everybody you like and everybody who apparently likes you has read it and is brooding on it to the same extent that you are. There's one journal about which that doesn't, um, I think, apply, and that's Private Eye. <laughs> um, because, I mean, I think Private Eye is spectacular. I think it's a national treasure. But I remember a few years ago, um, Private Eye reported me as having been seen in Paris um, having dinner with a, an Eastern European princess. Um, I'm sure that was the I knew. <laughs> but the princess, no, he was. Um, and that I'd, um, anyway, I more hair than Andrew, they were more of my own hair. Um, and that, um, and that uh, um, uh, I'd clearly been having an affair with her. And, I just thought it was, I mean, Lavender knew where I'd been that night anyway, but I just thought it was so fantastically flattering that, I didn't, <laughs> that people should have thought that I was still up to that sort of thing. <laughs> Whatever you know, been up to that sort of thing. You know, you know Lavender, that might be a double bluff. <laughs> Let me ask you this, if you were in a room accidentally and you saw, let's say, Rupert Murdoch, um, 10 yards away from you, would you feel an urge to go and talk to him or even be rather oily in a rather discreet way? I, I, I really don't think so. Um, I mean, he contributed, he contributed to, in a modest way, to the tune of 50 grand to our family fortunes. Um, and made the first book I wrote after Hong Kong into a bestseller. It was sold in America with a sticker on the front saying, the book that Rupert Murdoch refused to print, publish, <laughs> um, which did wonders for its sales. Now, I mean, I, I, actually, I actually think that, that Ru Rupert Murdoch is a sort of genius um, uh, when it comes to the Media, and I think he's genuinely interested in newspapers, unlike some newspaper writers. So I don't have a, much of a personal animus um, against him, though I think he's too powerful in some countries. And my favorite story about him is a Chinese story. When he was trying to um, start, true story, when he was trying to start a satellite station in China, and he'd been talking to Chinese leaders, and he had a meeting with Zhu Rongji, which is told by his own former Australian vice president in a very good book about him. Um, and he, he's talking to Zhu Rongji about his plans for China. And Zhu Rongji says to him, uh, is it true, Mr. Murdoch, that you were born in Melbourne? And Murdoch says, Yes, it's, it's, it is true. So, Jurongji says, so you're an Australian citizen? And Murdoch says, well, I'm, I'm not entirely anymore. So, Jurongji says, oh yes, um, isn't it true that in order to buy Fox and the American <coughs> newspaper, you became an American citizen? And 
Rupert Murdoch says yes, and Jiron Ji says, so if you buy a station in China, are you intending to become a Chinese? <laughs> are you marrying a Chinese? <laughs> Uh, yes, I think we, we don't want to enter into that uh, territory. But of all the uh, positions you have held, and there would always be dilemmas, problems, do you ever, as a devout Catholic, seek divine intervention in prayers? <laughs> yeah, sure. I mean, I, I think we all do, and we're slightly surprised from time to time when the um, when the Almighty doesn't immediately <laughs> spring into action. <laughs> um, but I, 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 have a, I have a rather old-fashioned view, and I was I, I I try this out on occasion, and people give me a little old-fashioned look. Uh, what a sanctimonious old bugger! Thing. But I actually think it's true. I think on the whole you get things right in life when you try to do the right thing. In Hong Kong, when you left, when you delivered the last telegram, in which you said very uh, movingly, I relinquish uh, this administration, God save the Queen, Patton. I think you were caught crying. Um, I don't think you have been caught crying over the BBC or the Oxford University. <laughs> Was that the one singular occasion when you have been um, caught as a lacrimo? No, I, 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 I look. I, I'm not going to dispute the fact. I don't think I actually cry, but I don't mind whether people wept, whether people think I cried or not. But in those circumstances. Um, when you had to listen during the course of an afternoon to Highland Cathedral played by a pipe band while you're presented with the Union flag, to um, Enigma Variations, um, to uh, uh, all those manifestations of what um, Barry Humphreys called the last night of the ponds. Um, <laughs> when you've, when you've uh, been through all that, and um, if you don't uh, dampen um, the edge of a handkerchief, then you're not uh, a human being. In fact, and people, 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 I think, consistently underestimate the emotionalism of the English. We're thought to be um, such stiff upper lip um, old farts, but actually the English are, as we know from Elgar and from others, we're quite emotional too. In fact, Barry Humphreys uh, sends his regards. He's playing <laughs> at the Palladium tonight, and um, regretfully cannot come and, um, and, and hear you. There was a wonderful, <laughs> was a wonderful moment when um, Barry Humphreys was staying with us at, at Government House, and he was he was filming um, in Kowloon, and he went off in the morning dressed as as uh, and Barry Humphreys, and he was. Um, he was filming as Sir Les Patterson and came back um, for lunch and he hadn't managed to change before coming back. So he came back in a sort of sick, splattered suit with his you know, tie all over the place, looking um, rat assed and, and the poor policeman at Government House went, went faced with this chap who said he was staying there. <laughs> a terrible time, but he, he's, he's a wonderfully funny man, and I hope that he's not actually on his final farewell tour at the moment. But do you, do you laugh every day, or make yourself laugh every day? Yes, sometimes, because I tell the same joke. <laughs> um, I do so much. I do so much speaking, and when, when you had a new joke, I got a new joke the other day. New jokes for the beginning of speeches are are really, really difficult and important. And I got a new one the other day from a priest, my favorite priest, who used to be the master of the Order of Preachers and now lives at um, Blackfriars in Oxford. He's a wonderful, wonderful man called Timothy Radcliffe. And he gave a fantastic um, lecture in Westminster Abbey, the Archbishop Romero lecture. And he told a story about a colleague of his, um, another um, Dominican, priest who'd been invited to lecture 
in Chicago and had given a lecture which he was aware, I and mean, you always are when you're speaking, I'm aware now, <laughs> he, 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 he was aware of the fact that he was going on rather long. <laughs> and also that he wasn't entirely carrying the audience with him in his arms. So after about 45 minutes, he winds up and sits down to very tepid applause. <laughs> so he turns to the chairman as three people are clapping. I once saw the queen clap with one uh, gloved hand against the other after she'd listened to a pop band in Broadcasting House. Anyway, it's rather sort of tepid applause going on. And he turns to the chairman and says, I'm frankly sorry about that. That clearly wasn't a great success, was it? Uh, uh, you know, really sorry for it. And the chairman says to him, don't worry, I, I wouldn't blame yourself. Uh, um, I, I certainly don't. I don't blame you, he said. Uh, I just blame whoever invited you. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so there's my laugh for the day. <laughs> Are you conscious that as a lot of people say, and say to me, that you are arrogant. I don't think so. Um, Isn't that an arrogant statement? Yeah. Ill-informed. Am I, am I, um, I think the people who say that, on the whole, the people who don't like the fact that when I'm uh, rubbished, um, I stand up for myself, and I think that's um, uh, what uh, makes them say that. But you don't really care. No, not really. And if I don't, um, if I don't display enough fr Franciscan humility, um, then so be it. I'm, uh, you know, um, I can think of. Um, no, I'll stop. That. <laughs> I used to say to people that I, I, I used to be very. Uh, you used to have a great deal of humility. Um, now I'm perfect. <laughs> Anybody? <laughs> no? All right, OK. There's a gentleman in that. Um, we're now in the year 2013. I have to count to uh, realise that's possible. It's a long time since 1997. Can you stand up? Sure, yeah. Stand up. My question is to Chris Patton. How do you feel? about Hong Kong in 2013, and in particular in the context of how you felt as you left it in 1997? My biggest worry when I left in uh, um, 1997 uh, wasn't that um, Chinese tanks would uh, roll down the streets of Hong Kong and uh, uh, the PLA would stamp out civil society. My biggest worry was that China, that Hong Kong would simply become the richest city in China. And I don't think that's happened. Um, I think Hong Kong um, remains a liberal society, um, a pluralist society, a largely free society with all the software and hardware that you expect of a, a free society except the ability to choose its own government. And I think that is partly because there is in Hong Kong a real sense of citizenship far greater than you find in most other Asian or a lot of other communities around the world um, and I think that's that makes Hong Kong uh, very special and um, of course um, I wish that uh, uh, Hong Kong had the whole shooting match and it will do one day um, and I don't think it will make it a less moderate or stable society um, but I think Hong Kong has done remarkably well. And here I am about to pay a tribute which I don't often manage, which is to say that one of the reasons for that is that I think the legal profession have behaved extraordinarily well. 
I think that was really good. For example, um, I think Andrew Lee was an outstanding Chief Justice. I think the, um, the bar and the, and the solicitors have uh, behaved very well. Um, I think that civil society is still extensive and vigorous. There is still an admirably free and tiresome press, um, which is a manifestation of Hong Kong's um, vitality. Um, the civil service is still probably the least, uh, or the most clean and least corrupt anywhere in Asia. And all that, I think, is hugely important. And something I was talking to uh, uh, the financial secretary before the reception and before dinner, and something we note um, at Oxford is that for a community of its size, um, it's extraordinary that Hong Kong has two or three of the best universities in the world's top 50. It's an astonishing achievement, which I don't think Hong Kong makes enough of. Well, I, I, I don't think you work, need to worry about the legal profession, because I think seven QCs from here are going out to defend the Quap brothers. Um, <laughs> now, um, QCs left after the lacking trial. Um, Lord, nor richer. Um, what have you listened to in music today, if any? I haven't listened to anything in music today, but in the last week I have attended a wonderful um, concert by, by a young Spanish soprano called Silvia Schwartz, who sang beautifully um, some Strauss and four last Mozart. Songs. She didn't sing the four last songs, unfortunately. Thank but God, there's a fifth one, actually. <laughs> <laughs> there's a fifth one? Yes. <laughs> Wednesday morning. Um, <laughs> she sang uh, Morgan. Um, no, I mean, I, I, listened, I listened to quite a lot of, of music, though on the whole I wake up to Radio 4, which is a speech station, and go to bed to Radio 4. I thought you don't really care about the press. I don't, but I care about what's going on in the world. Yes. And uh, uh, I care about what's happening in Syria or what's happening in Iran or wherever. Um, yes, Karen. Yes. Knowing what you know now, is there anything you would have done differently? Buried my wife earlier. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Lord Patton, one quick question for you. If you hadn't gone into politics, which industry would you have chosen outside of media? Well, the, the, it's, it's a very good question because um, when I was uh, a student um, or finishing at Oxford, um, I got um, a graduate traineeship um, to work in the BBC. Um, <laughs> And I went off to America on a scholarship first. I was supposed to be coming back and going to work at the BBC. Um, and I got involved in a political campaign in America and got the political bug and told the BBC that I didn't want to take up the graduate traineeship, which they regarded as a spectacular example of les majesté. Um, so it took me nearly 50 years to get back to the BBC. Um, but I guess that's the, that's the main answer to your question. The, what do I most enjoy doing in life? And what do I have the least time for doing now? I've been most happy when I've been writing books. Um, I love um, being confronted at uh, nine o'clock in the morning by a blank um, piece of paper. I always write by hand, I write on the same blocks of lined paper, and my happiest days, I know, are the ones where um, I'm writing, and uh, I'm looking forward not to ending um, 
being a um, chairman of the BBC, but I'm looking forward to the time when I can do that again. Um, Are you looking forward to uh, I'm, I'm looking for, I, I'm looking forward to having more time. Um, Oxford takes quite a bit of time as well, but Oxford is for life. I used to say that I was elected as chancellor at Oxford for life, um, rather like um, uh, others are elected for life, for example, the Pope and the Dalai Lama. And then the, the Pope screwed that line. Um, so I can only now refer to the Dalai Lama, and that gets me into trouble with um, the embassy up the road, so I can't say that uh, at, at all anymore. Um, but um, the, the danger you have with an appointment uh, for life is knowing um, you need a wife who will tell you that it's time to step down. My, my very distinguished predecessor, Roy Jenkins, who was a, who was a great man, went on um, into those years when um, old gentlemen, and I do it a bit myself even now, fall asleep. And there was a famous occasion when Mr. Gorbachev had been invited uh, to uh, Oxford to make a speech, and there was a great event in the Sheldonian uh, and everybody is gowned, and Mr. Gorbachev is there, and he's introduced by um, Roy Jenkins, who's up on the Chancellor's throne in the Sheldonian. Uh, and uh, uh, Gorbachev gets up and begins speaking, and Roy Jenkins, who was then probably um, 80 or thereabouts, clearly falls fast asleep <laughs> and sleeps soundly throughout Mr. Gorbachev's throughout Mr. Gorbachev's speech. And Gorbachev stops speaking, there is applause, Roy Jenkins still sleeps. And then it's woken up by that sort of, that terrible, penetrable silence, um, which um, uh, happens on occasions like, this, uh, like that. And wakes up very cheerfully and says, um, I'm, I'm sure that the uh, head of the university would like me to uh, express our gratitude um, for that extraordinary ovation um, by Mr. Brezhnev. And, uh, I mean, and Gorbachev was not amused. So, Lavender, you've got to stop me before I start falling asleep. I think it's slightly better than the one where I think Reagan arrived in some southern American country and for, I forgot which country it was listed. And uh, on this roster, with the president of the country, he was trying to remember desperately the name. And he eventually said, he says, I'm very happy to be, uh, to have come to, and then he looked across, and he's trying to get something clear, and then he says, uh, to Jinsan. <laughs> John Major tells a wonderful story about, about having a bilateral with them. Um, it's John Major's joke, it, and it's not his only joke, but it's, it's, it's a, it is an original John Major joke <laughs> about about having a a morning a, a bilateral with with uh, Yeltsin who come to Britain and they're meeting. Uh, John Major admitted afterwards slightly early in the morning for Mr. Yeltsin, and um, uh, they're in the cabinet room. Yeltsin sitting opposite, and John Major looking. Um, much the worst for wear. And John Major is trying to make light bantering conversation and says to Yeltsin, tell me, uh, Mr. President, what is the present state of the Russian economy? And um, Yeltsin says, good. <laughs> so John Major, uh, struggling for even more light bantering conversation, says, if you had to say a little more about the Russian economy, Mr. Yeltsin, what would you say? And Yeltsin says, not good. <laughs> uh, I'll take two more questions. I'll take two more Yes, yes. Yes. So I wonder whether you could share with the audience first meeting with uh, the Chinese Foreign Minister when you were Commissioner, and also your call on President Jiang Zemin a little later than that, because I think they illustrate the way in which matters moved on very rapidly after the time when you were being excoriated in the Chinese press and among Chinese uh, politicians. Yes, and I, I, I just say in passing that um, I've never been treated with anything other than uh, considerable courtesy um, ever since 
I was uh, uh, shriven um, as a sinner for a thousand generations. Um, the first meeting I had with the Chinese foreign minister um, was actually in uh, New York at the UN General Assembly. And he said to me when we met uh, uh, this time, um, Pang Ting Hong, he said this time we must cooperate. And I said, but that's what I wanted to do last time. Anyway, he then came to um, Brussels. He's a very, very nice man, uh, Minister Tang. Um, uh, in incredibly nice. And he came into my um, office with the ambassador, everybody very keen to make this a really friendly, cheerful uh, encounter. And he sees on the wall of my office a series of, of uh, photographs of my daughters. And he looks at them and says, your daughters? So I said, yes. So he said, how come? He said that such beautiful daughters have such an ugly father. <laughs> ambassador to the EU <laughs> was convulsed with anxiety and said, kept on saying, uh, the minister was, was telling a joke. What <laughs> was your response in China? I said, well, yes, they take off their mother. <laughs> um, the, what did he say? What did he say? You <laughs> weren't there. <laughs> I'll start, uh, you can't start at your age correcting my anecdotes. <laughs> the, the story about um, Zhang Jimin was, was in some ways more remarkable. Um, I was invited to make an, an official visit. We were invited to make an official visit in what, about 2001? And um, when Zhang Jimin was still in full pomp, and uh, we had a really interesting um, week or ten days in China. I was a European commissioner at the time. We fetched up in uh, Beijing and I was invited for a one-on-one -on -one, um, with uh, Zhang Jimin. I took him a copy, uh, a complete edition of Shakespeare and told him that um, I thought he would be interested in the history plays uh, since they underline the importance of political stability. Um, and we had a few japes like that. Um, perfectly good conversation. And at the end, uh, uh, we get up, uh, he shakes my hand, and his interpreter, a nice young man from the foreign ministry, as I'm going out, pulls up my jacket and says, uh, uh, Commissioner, Commissioner, he said, can you do something for me? So I say, fine, what is it? And he produces um, a book out of his um, inside pocket and says, could you sign this for me? And it was a copy of my book on Hong Kong, uh, East and West, a pirate edition from Taiwan. So, so I sort of thought that um, things went too bad after, after that, even though I didn't get any royalties. Uh, we, we, we must get on with dinner. Uh, so, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much, Chris.